Welcome OpenStack community. To kick things off, please welcome Akihiro Hasegawa. Konnichiwa, Mirasan. OpenStack Summit. Yokoso. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Tokyo. <laughs> Yes, my name is Akira Segawa from Japan OpenStack User Group. So when we started our user group, the number of members is really, really small. Maybe I think it's the same situation as your user group, I think. But today, I see a lot of influential OpenStackers here. And you know, in this Tokyo Summit, we have a more than 5,000 attendees from the 56 countries. It's a quite a nice number, right? <laughs> yes, now OpenStack is one of the greatest open source projects without any questions. So as you know, OpenStack is a community-based project. So we need your power to keep growing this community. So let's we put our head together here and make the world more innovative here in Tokyo. OK? So are you ready to start? Yeah. Yeah. OK. <laughs> we cannot talk about OpenStack without this guy. So please join me in welcoming OpenStack Foundation's Executive Director, Jonathan Bryce. Thank you. Thank you, Hasegawa-san. That is, uh, I would say, by far the nicest introduction anyone has ever given me. It's, uh, <laughs> it's great. Uh, a couple of quick notes here just before we get started. We have a simultaneous interpretation today. Everyone has a headset on their seat. Channel one is Japanese, channel two is English. We will have some Japanese speakers later this morning, so uh, you'll need that for, uh, for the English later. Channel three is uh, Chinese, and channel four is Korean. So here we are in Tokyo. This is so exciting to, uh, to be here. It's, uh, it's been a summit that we've been planning for quite a while, and uh, it's, as Akihiro said, uh, we have over 5,000 people here this week from 56 countries. So it is, uh, it's definitely the, uh, the largest event that we have had outside of North America. And uh, a couple of housekeeping notes before we get going here. As always, there is a lot of information on your badge um, besides just your name. If you look inside, there's a packet I think it's, it's like an octofold this time or something. We keep getting bigger and bigger. That's because this is a, this is a summit with a lot of content and a lot of locations. We are uh, spread all around this complex here with the, uh, the different Prince Hotels and the uh, International Convention Center. Right now, we are here in uh, the blue building. And here in this room, we are up on the top floor. Um, but we actually, you know, this, this is a, a, a very big event. And, We've had to expand our general sessions to a number of rooms. We actually have, I think, eight overflow rooms. Um, so you know, we have we have community members all over right now. There are some uh, filing into one of the other. Wave to them; they can see us. <laughs> and uh, and throughout the the week, there's going to be great content all over the campus. Um, in the uh, the Grand Prince Hotel, that is where the marketplace is. And I just want to say thank you to all of the sponsors. They make this event possible, and they make it possible for us to support um, having our developers here, having our travel support attendees here, and really you know, allow us to do great things for the community. So when you get a chance, go down to the marketplace. There's some cool things. I saw this, like, um, this 3D car simulation down there. That looked pretty cool, and some racetracks and stuff. Uh, design summit sessions are happening in the, uh, the Grand Prince Takanawa Hotel, and then there are a lot of work groups over at the, the Sakura Tower. 
It's a lot of information I know. Read the maps, as, as Claire Massey says, read the maps. Um, but if you uh, have any questions, there are friendly wayfinders everywhere. One other thing to mention, um, we have a, a new uh, updated version of our mobile app for this event. You can go through and you can find information on all of the sessions and a new feature is you can provide feedback. So please take the time to do this and uh, give us feedback on the different sessions that are happening. Uh, we take all of that and we use it to help plan future summits and to be able to, uh, to know what kind of content is really valuable for our attendees. So please, uh, when you get a chance, do that. Lunch, uh, again, you know, it's in a number of different locations. There is a lunch map available online and also if you pick up a copy of Super User Magazine, those are available downstairs in this building. It has a, uh, a lunch map. It's kind of like a treasure map, except for, for uh, delicious food. And you can find out where you need to go to, uh, to eat lunch. It's in pretty much every building, there are a couple of different options. And Super User Magazine has some really great content. It has uh, features on all of our Super User finalists. It has articles from uh, different community members, different uh, um, work groups. Uh, users, and, and so there's a lot of good information in there too. And one final thing to mention, um, in the marketplace, we have our Stacker Swag Store, and that's where you can go get your giveaway. We have, uh, we have uh, beautiful umbrellas, and, uh, and we have shirts that, that feature the We Are OpenStack symbol. This is uh, something that, it, that ties into an initiative that has been kicked off this year around diversity. You know, we, really um, have been trying to put effort into encouraging diversity in the OpenStack community and in the tech industry overall. So, um, you know, we are OpenStack. Use that as a hashtag as well. You know, tweet, Instagram, share your experience, show our diversity, and also make sure that you go get your, uh, your swag from, from the store. NTT Communications has, uh, has provided our network this week and uh, they know a little bit about networks. <laughs> so they have been, uh, been able to set up a really uh, fabulous network environment for us here, so thank you to them. And then one final uh, thank you that I, that I want to make is to uh, the leaders of the Japanese OpenStack user group. Putting these events on takes a lot of work, and you know the foundation staff is, is really small, so we depend on, on a lot of assistance from people in the community, and the Japanese OpenStack user group has been helping us for over a year to find the venue to help get things worked out. Um, it was uh, it, uh, maybe earlier this year, uh, Akihiro-san and, uh, and Tori-san were walking us around Tokyo in what I think was a record snowstorm. <laughs> to help us figure out how to, how to pull this off. So thank you very much to them for the support. You know, OpenStack is a very global community. Uh, we're here in Japan. Some of you may not realize we actually have three gold members who are based here in Japan. NEC, Hitachi, and Fujitsu is a new gold member this year. Uh, we have a, a large number of, of contributors who are from Japan, especially on the network side. And uh, we're gonna have some really strong Japanese users who are speaking today and tomorrow in the keynotes, and then also throughout the conference. So it's, it's really um, cool to see when we go to these events and we move them all around the world to see how global our community is. And that's what we uh, talked about in Vancouver is the OpenStack powered planet. How many attendees here are, are from Japan, actually? Raise your hand if you're from Japan. Okay, good. So. The rest of you are not. <laughs> How many of you uh, who are not from Japan are here in Japan for the first time? Wow. That's amazing. That is so amazing to see how many people are here in Japan for the first time. I've been fortunate enough to be able to come here a number of times and I always love being able to come interact with the community and it's great that, uh, that all of you are here and you're gonna get to experience that this week. As we travel around, as we see our global community, as we you know, put on events like this, one of the things that, uh, that we always see is a need for talent. We need more OpenStack talent. We need more OpenStack expertise. And a couple of years ago, we launched an initi initiative at the foundation um, to create a training marketplace. This was a marketplace 
where training providers could list out courses and, uh, and um, different uh, sessions that they would teach to help more OpenStack experts uh, be available. And you know, this has been pretty successful. We've delivered hundreds of courses in dozens of countries around the world in the last two years. But there's more that, uh, that needs to be done. We still have this gap in talent. And so one of the things that, uh, that I'm really excited to announce today is our first certification for individuals. And this is the uh, Certified OpenStack Administrator. Anytime that uh, you have a new technology, there's always a challenge in finding that talent. The talent always lags the technology. As I mentioned, we've had our training program, we've been working with universities, and now we're launching a professional certification to help tie those programs together and help uh, establish a good standard baseline of expertise and of skills that can be available worldwide. So this is going to be an OpenStack certification test that uh, is gonna be delivered virtually so that it can be, um, it can be used globally and the tests are going to be administered starting in 2016. So really excited about that and, uh, and looking forward to, to seeing how that rolls out and helps um, push more OpenStack talent. This is something that's been developed in the community with help from operators, from training partners, and, uh, and a number of different people who have a passion for, for education and for bringing more talent into OpenStack. Another thing that uh, we just announced was the, uh, the latest release, Liberty. This was the 12th release of OpenStack. And uh, it was the, the biggest release yet. We had almost 2,000 developers that contributed to this release. How many of you here had a contribution in the Liberty release cycle? Yeah, great. Thank you. So you know, these are the people that are, that are building the OpenStack software, and they're gonna have a busy week ahead of them as well. Um, the Liberty release cycle had over four million lines of code in it. And so, you know, the, the OpenStack world of software is continuing to grow larger and larger thanks to the efforts of, of our developers. In this release cycle, I think that there were a few themes that really stood out if you looked at the work that got done. Manageability, scalability, and extensibility. And those first two, when I went through and I looked at, at some of the updates that had happened and some of the new features that rolled out, things like a pluggable scheduler, um, you know, easier upgrades, and better performance in the upgrades, especially on the data side. You know, these are things that when I talk to operators, when I go to the operators meetups, when uh, our working groups like the enterprise work group and the product work group talk about OpenStack, these are things that they say are so important to improve the user experience. And I think that, you know, that, uh, that focus on manageability and scalability was really visible in Liberty. And so that, that really excites me because I think that shows that you know, we're on the right path and, and meeting user needs. And I think there's an interesting dynamic there. Anytime you have software, you have, you have two groups. You have developers and you have users. And uh, we have always you know, talked about users and talked about developers, especially at this event. It's actually built into the logo for the summit. If you look at that, there are the arrows with the users and the devs. But you know, in some software development models, the users are almost firewalled off from the developers. You know, the developers are, are hidden away somewhere and there are layers of sales and product management that, uh, that are between them. And you know, maybe the users can be involved at the front end on the requirements phase. They can talk a little bit about uh, what they'd like to see. And then it goes into this giant machine and sometime you know, a year, two year, depends on the company, could be three years later, something comes out and they, that's their version and they have to take it. But what's really awesome about open development models and the OpenStack development model is that everyone can be involved in every phase of the process. And users have the opportunity to be right in the middle of it. They can help with the requirements. Um, we have users who have been in the top 20 contributors consistently, like Comcast and Yahoo and others that, uh, that are actually writing the software. And we have new mechanisms like the working groups that I mentioned earlier that uh, allow users to have a voice. And so this is uh, such a key part of, of OpenStack, the ability to get involved and to impact the direction of the software and to contribute directly to it. That's a huge thing. And you, I think, we, you know, like, as I mentioned earlier, we saw that in Liberty with the, uh, the manageability and the scalability and some of those updates. But let's talk about uh, extensibility a little more. The Liberty release cycle was the first release cycle that happened under our new uh, project organization model. And the goal 
of uh, reorganizing the way that upstream work was, uh, was recognized and managed was really to encourage more innovation, to encourage more projects to operate in that model that we just talked about, to follow the OpenStack way and, uh, and to open up their development so that people could participate in it. And so we went from a release that had a, a, a pretty limited set of projects to something where we see uh, a lot of projects now that are, that are developed here. And this is not an extensive list uh, that says many more. Uh, but now, you know, there are, are official projects for, um, for things like uh, governance with Congress, um, for Magnum, the container service, uh, and, a, and a variety of new ones. Astara was one of the latest that's, uh, a <laughs> that is a, a, an SDN networking service. And, and so it's really encouraging, um, you know, the ability to, uh, to innovate and to move projects along and to get a lot of, uh, a lot of good development effort around them. Uh, but you know, that has been something that has been confusing to some people because now it's like, what is OpenStack? And what are all of these other projects? And so I think that, that uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about this and hopefully we can, we can clear it up a little bit. I think that you know, as you look at the world of OpenStack and you look at data that we get from our user survey, for instance, what you see here, there are some core services that are deployed 80, 90% of the time. Those are uh, are the services that are common across almost every OpenStack environment. They provide that base functionality of compute, storage, and networking. And then you look and you see great functionality, great innovative technology like big data analytics or uh, relational databases as a service that may not be as widely deployed, but that still provides a critical business function. And people and organizations, um, you know, they optionally deploy that as well if they need that capability. And this is, uh, I think, um, something that, uh, that is a really powerful model when you have a common baseline plus all of this additional capability built around it. That common baseline is something that, uh, that we talked about in Vancouver. In Vancouver, we announced our interoperability requirements. And that was, uh, was something that uh, we've been rolling out this year. And if you go to the openstack.org slash marketplace website, you can see the products and services that have complied with that interoperability guidelines. There are over 25 now in just the last five months that have gone through the testing process and have met all of these requirements and have a common baseline deployed in there. And so that's super exciting to see that, that come along. Those interoperability guidelines, as you know, pretty much everything we do, those are designed and built through a community process. And interoperability is so key to user experience and it's so key to ensuring that as we continue to move quickly on the development side, uh, we still have a common user experience that is available for all of our OpenStack operators. So I, to talk a little bit more about this, I wanna bring out the uh, co-chair of the Def Core Committee, Agla Sigler. So help me welcome Agla. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, Agla. Thank you for having me. Could you tell us a little bit uh, about why you think that interoperability is important and strategic and really key to making sure that, uh, that there's a common experience for, for users? So I think inter interoperability is really about user experience. With OpenStack growing in size and scope each release, it is really up to operators to decide what will be in each cloud that they operate. This could lead to slightly different flavors of OpenStack. Interoperability and DevCore is about making sure that uh, the lock-in in these special flavors does not happen. So um, you, know, you mentioned that that DEF Core there, and DEF Core is the committee that, that sets the, the standards for interoperability. Can you tell us how you guys approach that and the process that, uh, that you take to define those specifications? DEF Core is really a community-driven process. First, we start out by scoring capabilities. Scoring includes uh, looking at each capability and uh, seeing how commonly it is used, are other tools that are using it, and what is its technical direction. After we score it, we take it back to the community and say, is this really commonly used? What do you think about it? And we take the feedback and reevaluate and then publish in the next guideline. And so, you know, it's a community process and we have a big chunk of the community here this week. I'm assuming that DEF Core is gonna have some sessions. Can you uh, tell people 
how they can get involved if they are interested in helping to push uh, DEF Core and, and interoperability forward. We really need all of your help, and you have two ways to get involved. One is by providing data. To provide us data, run DEF Core tests using RefStack. RefStack was written specifically for DEF Core testing, and it helps you upload your cloud uh, test data to the OpenStack Foundation that they can evaluate, and we can actually see what is really commonly used. Another way to get involved is by participating in DEF Core meetings. We have meetings weekly on IRC. We also have DEF Core mailing list, and um, uh, you, you can reach out to either myself or Rob Hirschfeld, my co-chair, and uh, directly and talk to us if you are having any issues or questions. Also, this afternoon, we're having DEF Core 101 session. Hope you're able to join us. And tomorrow, we will have two working sessions. OK, well, thank you very much, Agua. Thank you, Jonathan. So if, if interoperability and, uh, and um, you know, a common experience across OpenStack clouds is something that, that you care about, there are a lot of ways to, uh, to get involved, and, and some that are happening here this week. Uh, Agla mentioned that they score, and one of the things they score on is around adoption and uh, maturity and the time that, uh, that a project has, has, uh, has been um, in development, and you know, a number of other factors. But I think maturity and adoption are actually two really important ones. And we, when we were in Vancouver, we talked about uh, maturity and adoption and put together kind of a quadrant that we called the innovation quadrant. Mark Collier talked about how most technologies start out as an experiment, and uh, experiments lead to breakthroughs, and you end up uh, with successful technologies being widely adopted and mature, and those are the ones that stand the test of time and, uh, and you know, really make their mark. If we go back a few years, you know, we go back to 2010, when OpenStack was first starting, we had the Nova Compute Service that was in development, and uh, that was a, uh, was a project that was fairly immature, you know, no offense to the, uh, <laughs> the team that started it, but it was very young. And, uh, and also, you know, there were two organizations that were running it, Rackspace and, uh, and NASA, and Rackspace was, was really only doing a POC work on Nova at the time. Uh, but you look at something like virtualization, and it was right near that breakthrough point. And you move forward five years, and virtualization is pretty much ubiquitous. Everybody's running virtualization in, in some form or fashion. <laughs> And, uh, and you know, in the OpenStack world, Nova is extremely widely adopted and has, uh, has made huge strides in maturity. And so that, you know, that's a couple of, of technologies. But I think it's interesting um, to think about this from an OpenStack perspective. And after Mark talked about this, I, I made a slide that uh, I presented a few times over the summer that had some different OpenStack projects on this quadrant. And, uh, and I see a, a lot of you taking a picture of this slide, which happens every time that I put it up. And so I thought, you know, that's kind of sad. Maybe we should give them this information in another way so they don't always have to take a picture of the slide. <laughs> and the other piece of it is it's constantly changing. You know, if we look at it now, six months later, um, in the most recent user survey, it was really interesting to see how heat and salometer adoption had, uh, had climbed. Um, neutron adoption had climbed a lot. Mark Collier is going to talk about that tomorrow in his keynote. And we have new projects. I mentioned Astara. Agla mentioned RefStack. Um, a variety of them. But we want you to have this information all the time, not just when I put it on a slide. So another thing that we're announcing today that I'm really excited about is a new section on our website, which is uh, all about navigating the world of OpenStack software. And we call this the, uh, the, the Project Navigator. So this uh, section talks about those common services, and it talks about a lot of that awesome innovation and the great functionality that, uh, that we're seeing happen in, in the OpenStack ecosystem. What's really cool about this is it pulls in data from the technical committee tagging effort. It pulls in data from the user survey. It pulls in data from the, uh, the ops meetups uh, tagging and, and ops data. It has stack analytics data. It pulls in tons of data from all of these different sources and presents it in a way where you can go and you can look at these projects and you can see you know, how, um, how widely deployed is it? How long has it been in development? And decide for yourself, you know, do I want to deploy this now? Do I want to wait until it's 
uh, you know, more well tested and, and more mature. Or maybe this is a piece of functionality that I know my business needs and I'm willing to be on the bleeding edge and take a little bit more risk. Um, so really happy to announce this and I hope that you all go check it out, openstack.org slash software. Uh, this is the initial release, so we want a lot of feedback. Tell us what's missing, tell us what you'd like to see in there and, uh, and we can uh, iterate on it as we go. What all of this points to though is I think an interesting, uh, an interesting situation that we're seeing develop. Many OpenStack environments start out and they look like this. It's a bunch of physical machines with a bunch of virtual machines packed on top of them. That's how, how most people start with OpenStack. When you look at the data from the user survey, and if you go to that software section, you'll see that there are some sample configurations. One of the things that was really interesting to see is that as people deploy something like Sahara to do uh, Hadoop, to do big data analysis, they are more likely to deploy Ironic as well. And, uh, far more likely than, than in other configurations. And so it's interesting to start to see some of those patterns emerge. And that's what happens a lot of times. They start out with virtual machines and then they have a use case like that where they want bare metal. Um, Magnum is a, a project that has gained a lot of interest in the last year and especially in the last six months. And that is about managing containers. And so, um, you know, eventually they, they want to offer a container workflow to uh, their users. And a lot of times they start out with containers and virtual machines, so they can have some extra isolation uh, and, uh, and more control around their environment. But eventually maybe they want to get maximum density and maximum performance, and so they put containers on bare metal as well. And this is something that is happening in the real world in OpenStack environments. And what is so powerful about all of these technologies being developed in this community is that you have all of these options and it's all in one platform. And then you look beyond just you know, bare metal containers, you look out to the emerging technologies that are so hot right now, like Docker and Kubernetes and Mesos and other things. People want all of these to work together. And, uh, and there's so many cool technologies being built right now. Uh, and you know, it again raises questions. People will ask me, do these technologies compete with OpenStack? Are they going to replace it? Do they need to run independently? Well, I have my thoughts, but what I want to do is actually bring out some really successful users and let them tell us how they see the world. So to start with, help me welcome from Lithium Technologies, Lachlan Evenson. Hajimemashite, Lithium no, Rokurani Benson to Moshimasu. Yoroshikonagaitashimasu. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here. You're all excited? Yeah, come on. I'm excited today to share our journey with containers to production on OpenStack. But that's not the best part. I'm going to demo an end-to-end -end workflow from commit to deploy in less than a minute in front of your eyes. Before I get into the story, though, and our journey, I want to tell you a little bit about Lithium Technologies. At Lithium, we help brands connect, engage, and understand their customers. And we do that via online communities and social monitoring tools. We do this for a bunch of big brands like AT&T, Skype, and Virgin. Back to my story. So six months ago, almost to the day, my boss and I were sitting in Vancouver at the summit. And we were reflecting on our cloud platform. We'd been really successfully deploying cloud, and it was consumed. But we didn't feel like we had that aha moment where the cloud had completely transformed the way that developers were deploying our app. Around that time, we started looking at containers. And what containers could do, we thought they would refine the process. They gave developers a clean handoff where they could build and ship their applications to a common infrastructure. We could also run that container on private cloud or public cloud. We thought this was really powerful. It just so happens that at that time, the developers came to us and issued us with a challenge. They asked us, can you give us a platform to deploy 30 microservices, standard pattern, in one month? Now, this might sound like a feat, but we took them up on their challenge we said, we accept your challenge. So before I went out on paternity leave, I threw up an internal repository and with very little info, gave a few developers access and said, containerize your apps. 
Two weeks later, I returned. The repo was full, and there was a post-it note on my desk saying, when can we go to production? And this was a testament to containers and the way developers could put their apps in and the ease of deployment. So then it was on us. We had two weeks to deploy an orchestration framework on the cloud. Thankfully, with OpenStack, we could overlay Kubernetes on top of OpenStack in less than one day. The rest of the journey was using the platform that OpenStack gave us to integrate logging, monitoring, and all these other suite of tools that we needed to correctly monitor and deploy containers. So with that, I want to go into what we did with containers. And we've been successfully running them for two months now in production. And I'm going to show you. So here is our workflow that I'm going to go through today. So this is our deployment pipeline from commit all the way through to push on the cloud platform. Now, the real bonus points down the bottom is we're actually deploying the same container to AWS and to OpenStack and attaching that all back. So this is the same, same container in both places. This is very powerful. Before I go into the demo, though, I want to just show you a couple of apps that we've pushed out and the monitoring we have. So let me go over to my demo. OK. OK. So here is an app. This app is called Real Time. Now, this app is running completely on containers in OpenStack. And what this does is aggregates globally all our uh, customer data and plots it on a map. This is a pul pulse of all the community activity around the world as we see it. So this is what's going on right now. As a testament to this, I asked for this feature one week ago to have an anonymous view of this data. The developer sent me an email five minutes after I'd made the request and said he had deployed it on the train to work, to production. That is a testament. Less than five minutes, he had this out with a URL. So this is a great result. This application is running completely on containers in OpenStack. Woo! Another thing I wanted to, to show was this is monitoring and logging. This is a dashboard we have. This is all, all open source through Datadog. This dashboard actually gives developers a bird's eye view of how the resources are being consumed. What I would really love to highlight down the bottom is we now have 122 running containers in production across 68 different images. And down on the bottom, bottom right there, you see the honeycomb. So that's the utilization of one production Kubernetes cluster. All right, now come with me on a journey. I am now Lachlan, the software developer. You're going to see the pipeline in action. I've written this app and deployed it. It's in prod now. This app is going to change the world. I think you'll love it. But wait, I just got a slack from my boss saying, your app isn't in high availability. And I don't really like the app. It's not politically correct. Fix it. So they're my two challenges. He's given me one minute to actually go through and fix all this quite graciously. So here I am. I'm at my workstation. Just got out of bed. I'm going to interrogate my little friend, Qbot, who talks to Kubernetes. And I'm going to ask him, what's running in OpenStack and AWS? My boss is right. I have one instance of my app running in AWS and OpenStack. So I can ask Qbot to give me more. Please scale that up. OK? Thank you, Qbot. Scaled. Woo! <laughs> so now I have three in OpenStack, and I have two in AWS. But we can see that they're not all running. So let's just ask him again and make sure they're all running so I'm all happy. Now I have five versions of my app. Fantastic, OK? Before I go into fixing my app, though, I really want to play it. And you guys are all really welcome to play this as well. It's online, croc-hunter.lcloud.com. And this is my contribution to the world as an Australian. So you can see this. I just want to get one little kick out of it. Oh, yeah, OK. I don't think lasers and crocodiles are actually a good way to go. So you know what? I think my boss is right. Let's go fix the code. Here's my code. OK, let's bump it to version 2. And let's, I, I just so happen to have a more politically correct version of the app. And I'm going to go check, check that in. Uh, bumped version. This is all live. I've checked it into Git, right? Off that git commit, let's go back and see what happens. Let's watch the magic here. OK. 
So here's my build server. We can see now that it's on git commit. Noticed that there's another, another artifact that it needs to build. It is building that right now in real time. What it's done is it's checked out the code, built, built a Docker container, put it in the repository, and it's ready to fire off a deploy job. So that should take, it's packing the artifact right now. It shouldn't take too much longer. But while I'm waiting, how about I just actually go back and play the game a little bit more? Because it shouldn't take too much longer. So if you guys want to get on, on this game, help yourself. It should be there. OK, so as always, it takes a little bit longer when you're doing a live demo. So it shouldn't be too much longer. It's telling me it's 34 seconds longer than usual. But hopefully, it should actually push this out. Great. It's been built. Now I'm in a deployment step. If I go into the deployment step, I can see that it's rolling out the replicas. So I'm doing a rolling upgrade of that container in real time in AWS and in OpenStack. That's getting pushed out right now, and we should be green. That is deployed. Let's, the proof is in the pudding, right? OK, I'm on v2 of the app now. You see v2? I've rolled that out. It's live. OK, <laughs> much better. I think the world really needs to fire fish at crocodiles. And I think, I, you know, I do not encourage this if you ever go to Australia, because you may, may be the last thing you ever do. So really what I wanted to highlight is how we could utilize the OpenStack platform to deploy new infrastructure like container orchestration with no engineering effort and no more CapEx spend, which is really the power of the platform. I want to thank you guys. I'm doing a session with the deep dive into this on Thursday at 11.50. If you guys would like to join, come and ask me lots of questions. I'll dig into how it all works. But thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you, Lachlan. That was great. And just to clarify, when he said he's doing a deep dive on this on Thursday, he's doing a deep dive into the infrastructure, not the Crocodile Hunter game. <laughs> Uh, that was a really cool demo, and uh, you know he kept talking about containers and OpenStack, and also as you saw AWS, and that's you know what what I hear over and over and over again. People want these technologies to work together; they don't want them to be different islands. So Lachlan talked about containers, but there are a lot of other things out there. There's bare metal, there's platform as a service, and so I have another user to bring out who uh, is is making use of of different technologies and integrating them into OpenStack. Help me welcome from Yahoo Japan, Takuya Ito. Good morning, everyone. My name is Takuya Ito. I am manager of infrastructure division related to OpenStack in Yahoo Japan. Today, I will talk about OpenStack use case in Yahoo Japan. At first, I will talk about Yahoo Japan with some example of our scale. Then, I will show you some data from our OpenStack production environment. Discuss the practical use case and operations of OpenStack. And finally, the reason why we choose OpenStack. First, I'd like to show you the scale of Yahoo Japan. This is the main Yahoo Japan site. We typically reach 64.99 billion page view a month. Next is the site for smartphones. Monthly page view for the smartphone is 31.9 billion which is become almost the same as half of the total page view from all the devices. Over 270 million apps has been downloaded. Yahoo Japan offers more than 100 services like news, weather, shopping, car navigation, and movies. This is a statistics of our operation in only open stack environment. The number of concurrent instances is now more than 50,000. Network utilization is six times more efficient than old bare metal environment. 
there is 20 petabytes of dead threads dedicated for the OpenStack environment. We have more than 20 OpenStack clusters running. Our OpenStack environment has doubled in the last year alone. One year ago, we ran 25,000 instances, and now more than 20,000. I'm sorry, 50,000. <laughs> the number of hypervisors has doubled from 2,000 to 4,000. OK, let's move to the next topic. Can you imagine what this graph shows? The answer is workload of our data center when some event happens. You can see spike here. Can you imagine what happened? The answer is an earthquake in Japan, just before this spike in workload. We only had tens of seconds for such sudden event. I'll explain what our app actually does later. But when people know certain natural disaster happens or receive disaster from app, they all come to a portal site like Yahoo Japan to know what's happening. And that causes the spike in the workload. We have more, some applications that give important information to users. For example, we have emergency notification and weather-related applications. These applications send emergency information like earthquake, tsunami, volcano, heat stroke, rainstorms. As you saw, we have some mission-critical applications in our data center. There are some discussions in Japan whether OpenStack can be used in the enterprise production environment or not. I think it is possible. But depends on the implementation of the applications. As an operator of the data center, we need to provide the resources rapidly. Need to keep working properly in case of emergency. And having the same interface for any operating environment is important. Whether it's KVM, VMware, container, and bare metal. Our mission is to make abstraction of the data center and OpenStack is a core technology. Why is it important to provide the same API in various environments? One is the importance of the speed of the development environment for applications. Also, if the API are the same, it would be easy to move an operating environment to another. Hence, if the same API are provided, then it would be possible to abstract the data center itself. I've talked that we can abstract the data center itself in previous slides. We can easily migrate physical environment to the new one having this production, uh, this abstraction. Also, we can easily set hardware life cycle. So can keep to have latest hardware and technology continuously. OK, let's move to the next topic. The function of the IaaS can be divided to three things basic function, minor function by each vendors, and the unique function used by each company. The unique function is such as monitoring system for security, approval system, 
and compliance monitoring. Before adopting OpenStack, we developed IaaS by ourselves. There were more than 10,000 instances operated in the environment before OpenStack. But the problem was that the API were proprietary and it could not cope with open, open source software. And now, after adopting OpenStack, we can use the common APIs and it has been more compatible with open source software. The basic functions of the IaaS are developed by the community. We developed the unique function by ourselves. And the minor function for the appliances will be developed by the cooperation of the vendors. We call this co-creation. By developing together, we can get the new function that is needed. And vendors can highlight the function to sell the product. Also, if there are people who want to use it, they can use the product has been proved to be operated in the large-scale environment at Yahoo Japan. We want a data center that evolves. To reach this, we need the concept of the data center life cycle management to keep the technology evolving. We can use the same APIs in all of the environments. The user do not need to be aware of the difference of the physical environment. This will allow us to use the right environment at the right time. we will are able to abstract the data center itself by this concept. Also, the cost is important. Even though it is an internal private cloud, the user should be aware of the cost. Lastly, we consider that co-creation with our partners is important. We contribute back to OpenStack community by releasing the work we do with vendors. In Yahoo Japan, OpenStack is operated as an infrastructure to support many users. One of the great things about open source software is that everyone's efforts combine to make success stories. The activities of the OpenStack community support important applications like Yahoo Japan. I would like to say thank you to all the OpenStackers. Thank you, Ito-san for uh, coming and sharing that story. It's so exciting when we do these summits and we're able to travel around and we meet you know, so many awesome users, developers, companies. It's, it's just one of my favorite things that, uh, that we get to do. You know, the, the interesting thing that uh, he mentioned is uh, exactly what we were talking about earlier. You know, this one platform with all of those capabilities that you care about, virtual machines, bare metal, containers, emerging technologies. You know, these are things that are happening in OpenStack and our open development model, model with all of the innovation that, uh, that our community is building. One of the things that, uh, that was in the Kilo release was the uh, ability to federate identity between OpenStack clouds. And this was something that we talked about in Vancouver. Um, if you go to that marketplace I mentioned earlier, you'll see a number of companies who are already supporting this. I mean, think about that kind of turnaround of innovation on a feature like federated identity. It comes out in Kilo five months ago, and now it's already downstream in commercial products and services that are available. 
So that is what is so cool about OpenStack. You know, it's the only platform that lets you do this. Bring together all of this innovation, containers, bare metal, virtual machines, platform as a service, private cloud, public cloud, tie it all together with federated identity. It is incredible what we're building here. So I want to just close by saying thank you to everyone who contributes to the software, who contributes to these events, to local events in your countries, and to the community overall. Thank you very much. You're making a huge impact, and I love seeing what's happening in this community and what we're doing to the technology world. So thank you guys, and uh, let's have an awesome week here in Tokyo. In Paris, we started awarding uh, the Super User Award to a team from an organization that was doing uh, you know, really great things in transforming the way their organizations use technology and also in pushing the community forward for OpenStack. Comcast won the Super User Award in Vancouver. CERN won that inaugural one in Paris. And uh, we're gonna go ahead and reveal the, uh, the latest Super User Award winner. Um, so we have Mark Mule and Sheila Sabi from Comcast to come back and, uh, and help us um, make this announcement. But before we do that, I just wanted to mention that, uh, as you know, we have the board of directors, we have the technical committee, and we also have the user committee, who are all um, key parts of the governance of the OpenStack Foundation. And Sheila was just named as uh, the, the latest and newest member of our OpenStack user committee. So help me welcome Mark and, uh, and Sheila. Thanks, Jonathan. It's a privilege to be here today to pass on the Super User Award. Um, it's, uh, we've got some slide issues here. One second. There we go. It's not running on OpenStack. So the Super User Award is meant to recognize teams using OpenStack to meaningfully transform and improve their organizations while still giving back to the community. The impressive nominees are reviewed by the super user judges and they're narrowed down to four. The winners are then chosen by a community vote. More information on this process can be found on the infographic in the print version of the super user magazine or in the user stories track. And here are our finalists. All right, the first company, FICO. FICO is a global credit scoring company. 90% of lending decisions are based on the FICO system. FICO has tripled in size and number of deployments and serving multiple Fortune 500 companies in production with OpenStack. And our second nominee is GoDaddy, one of the largest web hosting providers in the world, serving more than 13 million customers on the OpenStack platform. Congratulations. And consistent 25% growth month over month. All right, and the third company is Lithium Technologies. Lithium Technologies provides social customer experience management software to customers. They've currently got 1,000 VMs and expected to double by the year's end. Like Lachlan mentioned earlier, they also implement implemented Kubernetes running on top of OpenStack VMs. And our fourth finalist is the NTT Group, one of the largest telecom companies in Japan. They're going to be sharing several of their use cases this week including one on a web portal serving a billion page views and 170 million unique visitors per month. And uh, at the one-year snapshot, they had their Docomo email platform processing 170 million messages per day. And the winner is... Drum roll. NTT Group! Come on up stage, guys. Congratulations. Come on over. Congrats. Congratulations. Congrats. Congrats. Congratulations. Well done. Well done. Congratulations. 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 Congrats. How are you? Come on in. Congratulations. Come on up for a picture. Everybody come on down. We'll have to scoot it more. 
Can you go down this way? Yes. Come on. Big group. Here, you can... Uh, what is a big group? Here, we... So many. <laughs> Come along in front. There we go. All right. All right. Quick picture. Come on, on here. All right. Thank you. So, so um, in addition to uh, to this beautiful trophy, which you get to take back and display with pride. Um, we also are, are going to be uh, paying for the travel and lodging and uh, passes for two of your team to go to our next event, which is going to be in uh, April of 2016 in Austin, Texas. So thank you guys and congratulations. Yeah, thank you. All right. Put that down, head off on the stage. Mark and Sheila, and thank you for your continued contributions as well from Comcast. Um, that, was a, that was quite a crew. <laughs> I, I hope Ethentech, uh, you know, built this stage well. That was what I was thinking as they all came running up here. <laughs> so congratulations to, to NTT. Uh, it's, uh, it's great to have a new super user crowned, and we'll do it again in Austin. Look for uh, when we open nominations and, and get your submissions in.